Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the June Living with Disability Research Centre uh, seminar. Um, there's 43 people online. There may be other people joining, but we'll we'll make a start. Um, the June seminar is called The Legacy of Q Cottages, Changing Ideas About Intellectual Disabilities. And this is um, a very important seminar for some of us. Last night, uh, we launched uh, the new book called Fouled Ambitions, Q Cottages and Changing Ideas of Intellectual Disabilities. And this is, this is the book. You can purchase a copy of it from uh, Monash University Press. Um, and over 90 people came to the launch in person uh, yesterday um, from a whole, from across the history really of Q Cottages. Um, and so today, the, we've got three authors of the book presenting um, on different aspects of the book, so it will give you a bit of a preview of what's in the book. As many of you will know, particularly the people that are from Melbourne, uh, Q Cottages was a very familiar and still is um, landmark for many years. And many of the people uh, in Melbourne know Q Cottages, many are familiar with it, um, and many people working in disability services uh, still today started their careers there. It's like everybody seems to have a story about Q. They knew somebody who was there or they, they knew a worker. It was founded in 1887 as the oldest, in, and it's the oldest institution for people with intellectual disabilities in Australia. This book has been a long time in the making and it was part of an ARC linkage grant between La Trobe University and the then Department of Human Services that was originally funded in 2005. So it has been a long time coming, but there's been a lot of things in between. So the aim of this project was to undertake archival and scholarly research, interviewing for an oral history and participatory collaborative research with people with intellectual disability to document the cottage's history and publish it in a range of mediums. This book is the last of the outcomes from the project. There was an oral history that many of you may have seen from Corinne Manning called Bye Bye Charlie that was published in 2008. There was an exhibition of photographs and artifacts designed by Cameron Rose um, with, um, and before that Christine Jew that was in the State Library in 2008. There was a, a, um, a, a set of video, a DVD with videos and short films that were made with the residents. Um, there was a radio program in the Hindsight series that was produced by John Chebbett and Michelle Rayner. And there was a documentary, uh, a website that documented the history of Kew Cottages, um, which incorporated many of those photographs and films and used multimedia as an education resource for people about the history of Kew Cottages. Unfortunately, the technology for the website was superseded a couple of years ago, which meant it was no, could no longer be viewed. Um, in the last two years, the website's been redeveloped um, by uh, the staff at the Living with Disability Research Centre and Lin Linda Wong, um, the web, a web design specialist. So it now has a new domain, um, which is www.qcottageshistory-latrobe.com.au, and that will be on the last of the slides in the references if you want to have a look at it. So we have three speakers this afternoon. Before I introduce them, just to say, uh, if you want to ask questions, there will be time for Q&A. Uh, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, the seminar will be recorded. Uh, so the recording and the slides will be available on our website probably next week. And thanks to uh, one of our uh, participants in the previous session, we've now enabled uh, captioning. So if you click on the show captions, you can get the captions of the proceedings and you can get a full transcript of what's being said if you want to follow it that way. Um, so please make use of that option if you want to. So our first speaker is Leanne Monk, who was part of the original team and whose research is focused on the early part of the history. And then David Henderson's going to talk about the, the sort of second half of the history. And then I'm going to talk at the end about bringing the history up to date and what's happened since. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Leanne Monk from the Department of Archaeology and History at La Trobe University, who's going to talk about a distinct advance on anything yet to be done for the feeble-minded children of Australia. 
question mark. Kew Cottages from 1887 to 1905. So over to you, Leanne. Thank you, Chris. So as Chris said, uh, the Kew Children's Cottages opened in 1887. And they were Australia's first purpose-built institution for people with intellectual disabilities. By the time it closed in 2008, it was considered an anachronism, a relic of policies long rejected. A century earlier, however, perceptions of the cottages were very different. In 1889, one contemporary declared it a distinct advance on anything yet done for the feeble-minded children in Australia. And as that reference to feeble-minded children shows, much of the language used to refer to people with intellectual disabilities in the past is highly offensive and difficult to hear. Given the hurt it can cause, the question of whether to use it at all is a difficult one for historians. And I've chosen here, and we ultimately chose in the book, to use the contemporary language because it reflects changing ideas about what constituted intellectual capacity and the meanings attached to it. However, I want to emphasize that I don't share the assumptions that those terms express. So in fact, imagine that they're all in quotation marks, which they are in the book. In 1887, the establishment of the cottages reflected a new optimism about the capacity of children with intellectual disabilities. Traditionally, they had been considered ineducable, but in the first decades of the 19th century, experiments in educating so-called idiot children in Europe overturned this belief showing them capable of individual mental improvement through training. Those experiments encouraged the establishment of institutions dedicated to the care and training of idiot children. The first British idiot asylum, the Earlswood Asylum, opened in 1848. Four regional asylums based on the Earlswood model followed. Their collective purpose was the training of so-called educable idiots. Through the inculcation of socially acceptable behavior, classroom lessons, physical exercises, and industrial training, they aimed to encourage self-control and independence so that pupils would return to their families and communities more self-reliant and better able to contribute to their own support. The Q Idiot Asylum, as the Q Children's Colleges were first known, was intended to emulate these institutions, its methods consciously modeled on theirs. In 1898, journalist Alice Henry visited. Her observations and a series of photographs taken by prominent Melbourne photographer Nicholas Kerr two years later give a sense of what that system entailed. The system of educating children with intellectual disabilities consisted of several interconnected elements. Moral training emphasized self-control and proper social behavior. It is reflected, oh, there they are, sorry, I should have moved on. That's what they looked like in 1900. Ah. So moral training emphasized self-control and proper social behavior. And it's reflected in the exhortation that you can see on the back wall of the classroom, which says try to be tidy in this photograph. Formal schooling such as this aim to develop the children's mental faculties. When Alice Henry visited, she observed a schoolroom equipped with all sorts of appliances of the kindergarten type. Colored balls for counting, models and diagrams to teach form, pegboards to train accuracy of touch. In one class, she observed teachers using sensory experience to teach abstract concepts. A wooden cube is dabbed on a little one's face, she wrote. That is hard, hard. Then a wool ball, soft, soft. Physical training aimed to develop the patient's physical control. Inmates worked with light dumbbells, marched in order, walked on ladder steps, and did general drill, and did general drill movement for the arms and body. For contemporaries, industrial training constituted perhaps the most important element, preparing inmates for their intended afterlife in the world. By 1892, 14 boys worked making mats, so proficiently that the cottages supplied all the mats to Victoria's lunatic asylums. Others manufactured wicker work. Over time, this industrial work expanded to include tailoring and boot mending for the boys. 
Bell's industrial work was confined to laundry and sewing, reflecting the limited occupations open to girls and women in this period. Officials were keen to publicize the Idiot Asylum's achievements, showing visitors like Alice Henry through the institution and explaining the principles of treatment. Organized entertainments demonstrated the children's progress to the press and public benefactors. Displays of the inmates' industrial work were exhibited at the Warrnambool Industrial and Arts Exhibition in 1896 and the Victorian Golden Jubilee Exhibition in Bendigo in 1901. Hare's photographs reflect the same desire to demonstrate the institution's achievements. Likely commissioned by its officials, in his hands the asylum and its methods were carefully framed to the best advantage. And contemporaries were impressed. The judges at the Warnham Ball exhibition awarded the children a gold medal for the excellence of their workmanship. The exhibition secretary remarking that its quality was surprisingly good and would secure a ready sale if properly placed. Alexander Sutherland, one of the guests at a performance given for the Psychological Society, expressed astonishment at the abilities of the children he saw, proof he thought of the progress being made. Journalist Alice Henry was more circumspect, explaining to her readers that in comparison to Europe, the work in Melbourne was in its infancy. Nonetheless, she believed there was reason to be proud of the cottages. It was the only establishment of its kind in the whole of the Southern and Eastern hemispheres, and the work of educating and training the children was carried on in accordance with the latest teachings of physiology and mental science. So were these assessments right? Had the idiot, had the idiot asylum fulfilled the ambition on which it was founded to be an institution for the education and training of feeble-minded children? In his first reports, the superintendent, Dr. James McCreary, declared that the program of training had resulted in marked mental advance among many of the patients and an even more noticeable improvement in their habits and conduct. He even quantified the institution's success, telling an 1892 Intercolonial Medical Congress that an examination of all the children at Kew showed that two thirds had clearly improved. Patient histories suggest, certainly suggest that some patients did indeed improve. On admission to the cottages in May 1887, eight-year-old Edmund Legg could not speak and was only able to feed himself a little with a spoon. Three years later, he was attempting to form words, doing a little garden work and had some simple idea of drill. The next undated entry reported that he could feed himself and was generally better at table. By 1900, he was able to do general work, was brighter mentally and in good bodily health. The first entry in Henry Stanford's case history recorded that he was in good general health, did a little in the workshop and understood simple questions. By July 1902, he was working making mats and attending school. Four years later, his history declared him one of the best mat makers in the asylum. Other histories noted improvement in more general terms, such as some general mental advance or slight, slight general improvement. However, McCreary's own estimate that two thirds of, of patients improved suggests that a significant minority received little benefit from admissions. And patient histories do include examples where the institution was seemingly unable to help. 19-year-old Alfred Walters arrived at the cottages on the same day as Edmund Legg, but where Edmund's history testified to his improvement, Alfred's did not. A single undated entry noted that he had made no mental improvement, was unable to walk or talk, and spent his days sitting in an easy chair. For Alfred and many other patients, life was very different from the depictions in visitors' accounts and care's photographs, and they were rarely mentioned. Nor were those best placed to judge the institution, its residents asked their opinion. Visiting journalists had much to say about the patients, particularly about how their difference was written in their appearance, but none reported speaking with them. The silencing of people with intellectual disabilities in this way makes it difficult to know how inmates experience the institution. Occasionally, however, their voices break the silence, if only indirectly, their words recorded in their medical histories. In May 1904, after four years as an inmate, 19-year-old Catherine Hook made her desperate desire for release plain 
telling the medical officers that if she was not permitted to leave, she would commit suicide. Four years earlier, after several escape attempts, 22-year-old Annie Gately similarly, de similarly declared that she would kill herself. Their distress suggests that from the perspective of the people confined, the experience was not always the happy one depicted in the public image. Surviving evidence makes it impossible to know why particular individuals ran away or were as desperately unhappy as Catherine Hook, but it is possible to speculate more generally. In some cases, the reason seems clear. 13-year-old Rachel Matthews fled the asylum in 1901, only two days after her admission from home. It seems likely that the distress of being separated from her family and confined to an institution filled with strangers prompted her escape. Several weeks later, the medical officer reported that Rachel was rather more settled, and thereafter she seems to have accepted her confinement. Separation from family was considered fundamental to the success of training. The regimentation and constant surveillance contemporaries also believed essential to the training of idiot children may have also caused distress. Moral training intended to teach self-control and to inculcate socially acceptable behaviour, such as proper conduct at meals, involved potentially constant observation and correction by staff, both night and day. At night, surveillance was potentially intrusive and coercive, extending to the control of what McCreary called sexual vices, the practice of which he asserted was kept within a very limited compass. Visitors marveled at how well-behaved the children were at meals. Observing the 240 inmates in the dining hall, Alexander Sutherland wondered at the quiet way they took their seats, stood when the hymn was sung, and then began their evening meal of tea and bread and jam, all courteous in passing the dishes to each other, the whole meal passing in the comparative silence of subdued conversation. Sutherland read this as a mark of the institution's achievement. But such remarkable docility might equally be a sign of compliance to a coercive regime. There were certainly instances of abuse in this period. In January 1906, the senior medical officer, Dr. McFarlane, caught one of the nurses in the act of hitting patient Edith Yoris. Five months later, in a rare recorded example of a resident speaking out, Michael Foley complained to McFarlane of ill treatment. One of the warders, he said, had seized him so roughly that he nearly broke my neck. Letters from families also suggest that the public image did not always match reality. In May 1903, Paran mother, Mrs. Ferry, complained that her son was being neglected. On a recent visit, she had been shocked to find him very dirty and with bruises on both legs. Two months later, the mother of patient Ernest Colville wrote to the minister, alleging that Ernest had been grossly neglected and maltreated. Superintendent McCreary denied that there was any substance to either complaint. But at the very least, their letters suggest that the care their sons received did not measure up to these mothers' expectations. I did not, Mrs. Ferry declared, put him there to be neglected, but taken care of. Visitors made assumptions about how patients felt. In 1898, Alice Henry described the feelings she assumed the inmates' industrial employments might induce, asking her readers to consider the sense of just pride that wakes in a poor, useless child when he first discovers that he can create something. What a link with his fellow beings to be able to give instead of always receiving. Inmates may well have felt pride in their achievement, but then again, they may not. Some patients refused to work, Edmund Legg among them, but either way, Henry did not ask. Moreover, her conclusion reflects the negative assumptions about children with intellectual disabilities implicit to the discourse of improvement. That such training might create a link between the so-called idiot's child and his or her fellow beings assumes the prior absence of that link. In this, Henry's remark reflects the promise on which psychotherapist Joanna Ryan argues 19th century advocates made the case for training that it would lift idiot children from the bestial state contemporaries assumed they occupied. As McCreary expressed it in his presentation to the Medical Congress, training in idiot asylums humanizes, as far as may be, beings who are often more degraded than beasts of the field. <laughs> 
Contemporaries hoped that the training children received would enable them to return to their families and communities more self-reliant and better able to support themselves. On this measure, the institution failed. Only a minority, about 17%, or one in seven of all mates, inmates admitted between 1887 and 1907 ever left the cottages. And you can see the proportions in this uh, diagram. Contemporaries hope that the training the children received would, it, oh, sorry. Admission for most patients consequently marked the beginning of what was effectively institutionalization for life. More than half of the patients admitted in these years died in the institution. Many quickly succumbed to diseases such as typhoid and tuberculosis. Others grew into adulthood and spent decades in the institution. The status of the asylum as an institution for children condemned others to a similar fate elsewhere. Among the 16% of patients transferred into Victoria's network of public lunatic, lunatic asylums were those whose temperament and behaviour the medical officers deemed unsuitable for a children's institution. The general asylums could also be the destination of escapees and others considered refractory. This fate was not the one imagined when the idiot asylum was established in 1887. By the early 20th century, however, as fear of the so-called feeble-minded took hold, lifelong institutionalization was an outcome many contemporaries would applaud. In 1907, a severe typhoid epidemic swept the cottages. Schoolrooms were converted into a makeshift quarantine ward disrupting classes. In retrospect, the epidemic marked the end of the cottage's life as an institution for the care and training of feeble-minded children. Over the following decades, successive governments allowed the cottages to fall into a terrible state of neglect, condemning their residents to monotonous lives in a rundown institution. It would be 50 years before any meaningful reform. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. David Henderson, who is now an adjunct research fellow at the Living with Disability Research Center, having left after eight years with us. Uh, re he researched the history of Reinforce, the self-advocacy organization, and spent a lot of time uh, researching the second part of this book. Um, he's now the principal practice leader research and data in the Victorian Senior Practitioner's Office in the Department of Families, Fairness and Housing. Um, so David's going to bring us a bit more up to date. And uh, as you can see, the title of his talk is The Boy Tied to a Stake, The Tipping Campaign and Reform of Kew Cottages in the 1950s. So over to you, David. Again, remember that you can put questions in the, in the Q&A and you can use the captions if you want to follow that the text. Uh, thanks for that, Chris. Um, I'll just before I start, it's I'd like to say what a pleasure it is to be back here and also to see a um, seminar devoted to history. Uh, I spent eight years at the Living with Disability Research Centre telling people, wandering the halls, uh, telling people that I was a historian and people said, so what? Now you know the so what. It's uh, this book, among other things, but it's great to see this book come out. Um, so I'll start this presentation by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today and pay my respect to elders past and present and extend that respect to anyone who might be uh, joining us at this seminar today. Um, so on the 6th of April, 1953, an article appeared in the Herald newspaper that told the story of a boy with intellectual disability who had been tied to a stake in his own back garden. And with a few death strokes, the journalist, whose name was Edmund, Edmund William Tipping, set a tragic scene. He wrote about Michael, a six-year-old blue-eyed freckled boy who looks very much like your child on, or mine, but isn't. He's so different that until a few weeks ago, he spent most of his days tied to a stake. So the Herald had found Michael sitting in the dirt. He was chewing on a piece of rubber and humming quietly to himself. Michael, Tipping explained, is mentally retarded. And I'd remind uh, the audience here, just as, um, as Leanne said, that we're just using the uh, language of the time. Uh, and so all of this is in uh, quotation marks. But he's, an he's as active as any normal child, and he can get into all of the dangers that a normal child can get into. 
Tipping reported that Michael's father had just come out to give his son a drink when the police and of course the Herald arrived at the scene. What followed next might have been a scene ripped from a movie. As the two detectives untethered Michael from his rope, his mother cried bitterly and took him in her arms. The world will say that we've been cruel, she sobbed, but we haven't. She explained how she would send her son to an institution if there was only one she trusted, but she really made it clear that she did not consider Q Cottage, uh, Q Cottage as a viable option. I will never send him to those terrible Q Cottages as long as I live, she said. So Tipping acknowledged that the story of the boy tied to the to the state might at first glance appear to be the story of abject cruelty and neglect, but he would not blame the parents for their actions. For one thing, he said that the boy was well looked after and his parents clearly loved him. There's no doubt about that, he wrote. Rather than blame the parents, Tipping bemoaned a civilized society that would treat some of its most vulnerable citizens and families with such scant regard. He also tried to convey something of the problem that parents who chose to look after their children with intellectual disability at home were forced to address on a daily basis. So a second article in Tipping's two-part series appeared in um, the Herald the following day. And while it took up, and this, this one took up the story of Michael in, in a new environment at the Kew Cottage where ultimately he did end up. And it's hard to read this article as anything other than an attempt to rehabilitate the reputation of institutional care. So there's two images at the top of this article that set the scene. And the, uh, the first image shows a smiling, well-dressed nurse attending to um, a handful of children in Michael's new ward, which was Ward F4. Two well-appointed cots are visible on one side of the room, and clearly this is not the image. I'm just showing some images of uh, the Kew Cottages as we go along. I don't have a photo of this article at the moment. But um, on one side of the room, a small shelf displays a neat row of toys. And although it's impossible to see in the black and white image, we're told that the walls of F4 have been freshly painted in an array of bright colors to keep the children stimulated. Um, a second image provides this really stark contrast to this cheery, se cheery scene. And this image shows uh, an unrenovated ward with two, uh, two rows of really tightly packed beds squeezed into a dreary room that has paint peeling from the walls. And a headline above this, uh, these two images states the obvious, things are better for some children at Kew than they are for others. So the article that uh, the accompanying article sought to make it clear that things were now better for Michael now that he was at Kew. When Tipping visited Michael at the Kew Cottages, he found the child sitting in the sun. In just a few weeks, Michael had been completely transformed. He was dressed in bright red overalls. His hair had been brushed. His shoes had been polished and his cheeks had what Tipping referred to as a ruddy glow. In this article, Tipping explained that Michael was one of the lucky ones at the Kew Cottages because he had been placed in a refurbished ward and he intimated that being housed in such modern comforts provided Michael with a sense of security that he may never have been able to experience at home. Even Michael's mother, Tipping said, had been forced to admit that her son was better off in this new environment than he was tied up to a stake in his own backyard. Hope is written all over this corner of Q, wrote Tipping, who went on to explain that if, if there were more wards like F4, there would be hope for many of the other children at the cottages as well. So it's fair to say that Tipping's two articles touched a nerve in the wider community. And the editor of the Herald, Herald later recalled that as soon as those articles were printed, letters began to flow into his offices and they showed that the problem was more common than I had imagined. And incredibly, for the briefest moment, the tipping articles also woke up some people from their apathy. A day after the second article was published, the Herald announced that two readers had sent in money to help improve conditions at the Kew Cottages. One man from St Kilda enclosed a cheque for around five pounds for the provision of a few comforts for the poor little aimless souls of F4. He expressed the hope that many of your other readers, shocked and humble as I am, might similarly help. And soon money was flowing into the offices of the Herald from all over the state. We had no intention of running an appeal, wrote uh, the editor Edwards uh, at the time. But as money started to flow, uh, Edwards was forced to change his mind. So on the 10th of April, 1953, the Herald announced that it, it had opened an appeal to fund to help fund the reform, help fund some reforms at the Kew Cottages. 
And this appeal, which became known as the tipping appeal, lasted for two weeks. And the Herald kept up this running commentary the whole uh, throughout this appeal about all of the funds, uh, all of the uh, donations that were coming in. And there were big companies who sent in money, but there were also people who sent in sometimes less a, a pound or less than a pound to uh, to assist those. What often they referred to as poor waifs at Q or some sort of similar language. And uh, the appeal closed on the 24th of April, 1953, by which time more than 23,000 pounds had been raised. And halfway through this appeal, the government had announced that it would match each contribution pound for pound. So that brought the total of that the appeal to around 47,000 pounds. And that was a significant amount of money at the time. So today that amount is roughly equivalent to £500,000, uh, $500, sorry. And at the time it represented just under one sixth of the entire expenditure of the mental hygiene budget for 1953-54 financial year. So that was the, the, uh, the budget that looked after institutions across Victoria. So there we have it. We have this episode in the past, in the past, a two part series of newspapers about the Q cottages that leads to an extraordinary response in the community of giving to improve the lives of residents at Q cottages. And of course, we could leave it there. But Chris has said I should need to speak a little bit longer than five minutes. So I will continue the story. Uh, and we have we have this story of cause and effect, but what I want to do over the next 15 minutes is really try to get inside that episode and understand something of what that episode means. And that's really what we do do as historians. We try to get in episode, get inside these episodes. And to take you inside this episode today, I want to focus on the recollections of some of the people who were there at the time. And the first person uh, we'll uh, turn to now is Irene Higgins, the first social worker um, at the Kew Cottages. And if you do get a chance to read this book, I hope uh, Irene Higgins shines off the pages. She's an amazing character. And um, the, her contribution to Kew uh, is extraordinary in the way that she brought families and the community uh, inside those sort of uh, uh, the barriers that, that had been established around Kew for more than 50 years. Um, so as early as 1950, there had been discussions within the Mental Hygiene Authority about the prospect of getting a social worker to act as this contact between the relatives and cottages. And that job ultimately went to Higgins, a young Polish woman who had been living in Australia for over 10 years. Irene Higgins was a softly spoken woman who by her own account had always wanted to leave a mark on the world. When she was 19, Higgins enrolled in social work at a university in what was then uh, called Polish Ukraine. And when she was 23, Europe was lurching towards the Second World, World War and Higgins had graduated and was considering a move abroad. She left her family and the country of her birth for Australia at the end of 1938 and, and settled initially at least in Perth. After short stints of living in Brisbane and Sydney, Higgins and her husband settled in Melbourne in 1954. And Irene Higgins was 28 years old at the time, a mother of a young boy and still trying to find her way in the world. So Irene Higgins first visited the cottages in 1950 when she accompanied a young mother who was contemplating placing her child at Kew. And like everyone who encountered the institution in those days, she was shocked by what she saw. It stunk to high heaven, Higgins later recalled. Yet, where many recoiled from that squalor, Higgins saw in the cottages an opportunity to make a difference. When she left the cottages behind that day, she promised to herself that at some point in the future, she would return to work for the children at Kew. So as I said, the Kew Cottages had never employed a social worker before. There was no job description and certainly no predecessor upon whose labours she might be able to build. And in those early months, Higgins, Higgins got to know every building every unit, every ward, just by walking around. She took copious notes and introduced herself to residents and staff. Um, she conceptualized her own role as this liaison or link between the community and the institution. And above all, and she, she writes really eloquently about this, she bemoaned the extent to which families were ignored by staff running the institution. There was no one to talk to, prospective parents, Higgins later recalled, no one to explain to them what was going to happen to their child. So Higgins believes, believed that parents of the residents at Kew were isolated, often ashamed and lonely in their problem. And she did spend a long time, uh, she, she played this crucial role in setting up uh, 
setting up the Kew Cottages Parents Association, which re really does play a strong role in the latter half of uh, this institution. But today, uh, this talk's not about uh, the Kew Cottages Parents Association, it's about the tipping campaign. And Higgins did also recall something of the tipping uh, campaign and the boy uh, tied to a stake. So the first thing she said about the tipping campaign was that it was more stage managed than it first looked, which is something I found really intriguing when I came across this piece of information in her uh, transcript. She recalled that sometime in April 1953, Dax had told her a story about a child that was sort of on a leash. When she went to investigate, Higgins found the poor parents were wonderful parents, but also that their son could climb a bare wall. Given that they lived next door to a butcher who always had a cauldron of fat burning in his back garden, the parents had been terrified that their son would climb over a wall, climb over that wall and hurt himself. Higgins recalled uh, that the parents, desperate to get on with their work, they ran this small business from their home, had tied their son to a stake for his own protections. And Higgins was, con but Higgins was convinced that this was not a story that Dax wanted to hear. Dax didn't like it, she recalled. He wanted the story to be sort of horrible. Now, Higgins' questions, Higgins, Higgins's recollections raises more questions than answers. First, what does she mean by a, a sort of horrible story? And second, convenient for, for, conveniently for me, uh, who is Dax? And it's Dax who I want to turn to now. Um, Eric Cunningham Dax was a tall, softly spoken Englishman who, after a worldwide search, had been appointed chairman of the Mental Hygiene Authority in 1951. So the hygiene, Mental Hygiene Authority was the branch that oversaw Victorian's, in, Victoria's institution, uh, institutions. And in England, Dax had been deputy superintendent at Mathern Hospital, this 2000 bed psychiatric institution in Surrey. Uh, Dax was considered a bit of a reformer and an innovative thinker. And there was this sense of trepidation around the arrival of Eric Cunningham Dax in Melbourne and a new hope about what he might be able to achieve. So there's a, psych a psychiatrist, Reginald Spencer Ellery, captured this mood when he identified Dax as this real focal point around which the modernization of this decrepit mental health system might be implemented. And this is what he wrote. The eyes of Victoria are now focused upon this mild-mannered man. Pious hopes are invested in him by those who watch him roll up his shirt sleeves and face his tasks. So before Dax uh, took his job, he'd made it quite clear that his salary package should include a car and suitable accommodation to house his extended family. And the Victorian government had acquiesced to all of, acquiesced to all of his demands that provided him with a new FX Holden and a two-storey Edwardian mount, mansion in Kew. The government had purchased this 12-room 12, 12 mansion for much-needed accommodation for 35 nurses who were living in the most appalling conditions at the Kew Mental Hospital next door. But ultimately the nurses would have to wait and Dax moved his family into that uh, mansion. And perhaps most importantly for Dax, he'd arrived in Victoria with a mandate to implement reform. There was this real appetite to reform the uh, mental health system and uh, the Kew Cottages more specifically. But there was also this stumbling block that Dax could never easily negotiate. So the Mental Hygiene Authority remains subject to the provision of the Public Works Act when carrying out any maintenance or repair work on the institution and un institutions under its control. So this really meant that Dax did not have authority for securing capital funding. He could only put in requests for finance and wait for those to be approved or denied. So Dax, cha Dax chafed against these constraints for many years. And as, it was as early as 1952 that he's already expressing these concerns about frequent delays in responding to urgent requisitions for capital and maintenance works at a number of the institutions across the state. He said, I blasted them uphill and downhill. We never called each other by our Christmas names as there was too much fighting. So here we have this man bent on reforming the system. He's also got a quite significant budget compared to the, his predecessor, but he's coming up against this red tape and bureaucracy, and it's a situation he finds extraordinary, extraordinarily exasperating. Much later, once he was no longer working for the Mental Hygiene Authority, Dax expressed in even stronger terms his views about the Department of Public Works. They were just sitting on their rear quarters doing absolutely nothing, Dax recalled in one interview. I was ringing up day after day to demand this and that, 
and then going to the newspapers about it. Now this point about the newspapers is an important one. Ever since he'd arrived in Australia, going to the press had become something of the way, some, some, a part of the way that Dax operated. So one of his friends, Keith Bend, later recalled of Dax that his style was so entirely different from the old public service method. He would get on a radio and say anything. For Dax, his willingness to talk to the press was rooted in his this belief that the newspapers and the broader public were on his side. Dax was actually convinced that the press felt somehow or other that they were involved. I mean, they were on our side, you see. So straight away, it wasn't a matter of complaining against us. It was a matter of complaining against the government. And it probably helped that Dax cultivated friendships with the, the press in order to get his message across. So he took journalists uh, from various newsletters out to lunch at the Windsor Hotel, this grand 19th century luxury hotel and restaurant on Spring, Se Spring Street that was situated conveniently across the road from Parliament House. And he also invited journalists to his home in Kew. Um, Edmund William Tipping, the journalist at the Herald uh, who wrote those articles, was one journalist who spent more time at the Dax resident, uh, residence than most. Dax had first met Tipping and his wife, Marjorie, shortly after they arrived, after he arrived in Australia, and he immediately connected with them both. Dax thought that Tipping had thought Tipping and Marjorie wonderful people, and soon they became great family friends. Tipping was just as fond of Dax. Um, and in 1963, he managed to convey some of that fondness when he wrote a personal profile about Dax for the Herald. He described Dax as a slim, fit and vital Englishman who regards himself as very much Australian now. Dax, Tipping wrote, likes normal people because they are normal and entertain entertainingly unpredictable. And he likes abnormal people because they are just people who are rather more unpredictable than normal people. So the plot thickens. So let's take a closer look at Tipping himself. What does his story tell us about the boy tied to the stake? Um, Edmund William Bill Tipping was a University of Melbourne man, a part-time punter and a raconteur with a sharp wit. Tipping was born in 1915 in Mooney Ponds and educated in Turak at St Kevin's College where he became school captain in 1933. By the time he had made his way to Melbourne University, Bill Tipping, had, Bill Tipping had his fingers in a number of pies. He studied law, he edited the Farago, the university newspaper, and he ran the debating club in his part time. And he also worked as a part time correspondent for the Herald. Uh, shortly before the outbreak of the Second World War, he, he had become a full-time uh, employee at the Herald. What else do we know of Tipping? Well, for one, he was himself well-versed in the problems associated for uh, caring for a child with intellectual disability disabilities at home. His own son, Peter, had an intellectual disability and had recently turned five. And eventually, uh, Peter would also end up in Kew Cottages with Michael. Tipping knew from his own experience that there was no proper support ne networks for families who wished to raise their children at home. And he tried to explain to his readers that if one chose to raise a child with an intellectual disability at home, one did so fully aware that they, were, they would have to do so on their own. As a newspaperman, Tipping set great store in placing himself at the forefront of the events about which he wrote. His colleagues commended his eye for detail and his propensity to absorb information ex at extraordinary speed. Tipping, as one former colleague put it, was also a forceful campaigner who was never happier than when exposing an injustice or helping to make somebody's life better. So we have Higgins talking about the Tipping campaign as a stage managed fair. We have Dax, a man with a vision for reform, but unable to let, uh, get the government to act. We have Dax, an astute operator in the press and his friends with the, journal, the journalist who wrote those original artic articles. And now we have Tipping, the journalist committed to social justice, who has experience of raising a child with intellectual disability at home. And I think we can see where this story of the Tipping campaign is heading, but I ju just want to now turn to the rec recollection, recollections of one more player in this story. And that's Cecil Edwards, Tipping's boss and the editor of the newspaper that ultimately ran the two-part series, because Edwards does throw further light on what Higgins called that stage manic nature of the affair. And conveniently for this presentation, he brings some of the strands together of this uh, story. 
And I'm aware that I'm playing a narrative trick here. This is something that we have to do as historians as we marshal the facts of the past to tell a story. So Edwards had first been informed about the boy tied to a stake in 1952, but he was not sure how to deal with it at the time. Under Edwards, the Herald had played a significant role in exposing the terrible conditions at a number of institutions across the state. Ed Edwards was proud of his paper's achievements. He believed that ex in exposing these conditions, his paper could make the government and the community meet their responsibilities. But he also believed that such exposures had actually discouraged parents from sending their children to institutions such as the Kew Cottages. And all of this crystallized in his mind that the story of the boy who was tied to a stake should be presented not as a, what, what he said, a one day wonder of reputed cruelty, but as a cautionary tale that might awaken a government and a people to do their duty. So Edwards recalled that he contacted Dax who sent his own experts to examine Michael. Next, Dax and Higgins convinced the parents to admit their child to Kew, where Dax promised he would, be he would be placed in a newly refurbished ward. While Dax set about arranging for Michael's admission, Edwards deliberately assigned the story to Tipping, who had a child with intellectual dis disability of his own and therefore faced what he called a similar though not identical problem. Tipping spent a few days on the investigation and his first visit to the parents, parents of Michael was carefully orchestrated to co coincide with the arrival of the police because, as Edward put it, to investigate and publish without telling police would make it seem that we cared less about ending the abuse than getting our headline. And a few weeks tip later, Tipping visited Michael in his newly refurbished ward at Kew. By early April, the story was ready for publication and although it had aspects of cruelty, it was not that horrible story that Higgins believed that Dax had so desired. As Edwards later admitted, uh, the cruelty at the heart of the story was really a peg for a greater theme and that theme was closer to the heart of Edwards, Tipping and Dax. It was this theme about the necessity for reform. The intention of the articles, as Edwards later explained, was to ensure that the Kew Cottages would be transformed into a place which to which distracted parents would not be afraid to send their unfortunate children. There must, and this is what he wrote, there must be adequate funds and staff to provide kindly, firm, constant supervision, which was impossible for parents to maintain while they were earning a living, running at home and bringing up a normal family. There must be comfort, cleanliness, good food and every care to make as pleasant as possible the lives of the children whose brains would never grow up. Um, and all of this, of course, fed nicely into the program of reform that Dax was already trying to implement. And as Dax no doubt knew, the public expo exposure would also apply timely pressure upon a department of public works that was failing to respond to what he referred to his own polite demands. So all of this is to say that the story of the boy tied to a stake is more than a story about cruelty abuse and neglect of children with intellectual dis disability. It's also a story about the role that the media has played in shaping the history of the Kew Cottages and more broadly public perceptions around the problem of intellectual disability over time. The, boy, the story of the boy tied to a stake should be read in the context of these frequent exposés about the atrocious conditions at Kew and the oft-repeated calls by news outlets for inquiries and royal commissions, which kept the plight of those poor waifs at Kew at the forefront of many people's minds. And it suggested in the latter half of the 20th century, at least, the media could and did play an important role in forcing a reluctant government to institute reform at Kew and other institutions across the state. Thank you. So it, I'm really pleased to actually introduce this third part of this amazing series of presentations today, looking at, at the history of, of Kew Cottages here in, in Melbourne. And Kew closed, just as a reminder, in, in 2008. And Chris was involved in the history project, but also she was involved in the evaluation of the closure of Kew and the project Making Life Good in the Community. And that study helped to give us a sense of either the success or otherwise of the closure and whether policy ambitions were indeed fulfilled. So her presentation draws on the epilogue of the book today. It reflects on changes since the closure of Kew, closure of Kew Cottages and the success of the 
of deinstitutionalization for former Q residents. It considers some of the enduring themes evident in the lives of people with intellectual disabilities that were identified throughout the history of Q and continue into the present day. So I'm going to hand over to you, Chris, to, to actually bring us to the epilogue and to give some insights into that component of this history. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jacinta. And this is the end of history, so I'm going to talk about moving into modern times. Um, I'm going to talk about what happened post the book and when Q closed. As, as many of you know, Q closed in 2008. But before that time, during the 1990s, it had been downsizing and people had been progressively moving out into small group homes into the, in the community. When the site actually closed, 100 people uh, remained on site in new group homes that were clustered in the bottom right hand um, part of the site looking from the top and everybody else had moved uh, to small group homes in the community that were originally managed either by the state government directly or by NGOs and as part of the shift to the NDIS all those houses are now managed um, by some of the large NGOs um, in Victoria. So the state government has completely sort of withdrawn um, from that picture. So what I want to do very briefly today is just talk about what happened to those people, the particular people who left Q, what were the changes in their lives, and then what have been some of the changes and continuities more generally uh, for people with intellectual disabilities since Q, and how do those some of those themes, particularly the main theme of the book about unfulfilled failed ambitions, how have those things continued for people with intellectual disabilities? So we did a project called the Making Life Good in the Community Project, which was a fairly substantial project that went on for a number of years and produced a whole series of very detailed reports, primarily about five group homes that people moved, moved to. It was an ethnographic study um, of, of, the, of the lives of those people in their new group homes. And there was a book that was produced called Group Homes for People with Intellectual Disabilities that was published in 2010, authored by Tim Clement and myself. And we subsequently went on to reanalyze that data with a cultural lens to compare those group homes to some what we classified as better group homes. And we also conducted a large survey um, that involved 100 residents and we looked at what was happening to their quality of life before they moved from Q, and then, then afterwards, 12 months afterwards. So what we found, not surprisingly really, was that there was a much improved material conditions for people living in, in new group homes. Um, if you read the book, you will read about the terrible conditions at Q over its history. So in the new group homes where people were, they were on a small scale. There were no more than five people in each house. They were dispersed through the community. They were near to community facilities. People had their own bedrooms. There were sprinklers. Um, there was heating. There was cooling. People had their own clothes. Uh, people were known by their own names. And they had reg regular day activities. They had places to go during the day. And there was no question that people had a better quality of life, just like all the other research on deinstitutionalization. It was better living in small group homes in the community than it was living in large institutions like Q. And there were significant positive changes in terms of choice and control, using community facilities um, and in people's social networks. But and there were significant reductions in people's uh, maladaptive behavior in depersonalization of people and in treating people as part of groups. But what was really clear is that people's networks, people's social networks remained very small. And in fact, people's contact with their families declined after they left the institution. And our findings that were, that were published in 2012 showed that only 28% of people in the study had weekly contact with somebody without an intellectual disability. So people continued to live in what we called at that time a distinct social space that was comprised of staff, families, and other people with intellectual disabilities. 
there was, interestingly, there was variability among the groups of people um, that moved and among the group homes. The 100 people who stayed on site were what we called the known locality. So they stayed in their own local area and they stayed living quite close to people that they knew. And they actually had larger social networks than the people who'd knew, moved to different localities in the community. And they stayed in touch with um, their friends who had also had intellectual disabilities that weren't living with them anymore, but were living just round the corner and up the road. So those people in terms of social connections uh, were doing much better than the people who'd moved to new places in the community. And during the closure, there was a lot of emphasis on, on, on active support, on community participation, um, but despite that emphasis, there was a very low level of resident engagement in their own homes um, and, and their relationships with people without disabilities or their involvement in community organisations. We categorised these houses as being underperforming in terms of community inclusion, engagement and choice and control. So although things had got better, they were underperforming in terms of what other research showed was possible in small group homes. And the culture of these new houses was very similar in many ways to that of the institution. It was less harsh and it was less extreme, but there were still rigid routines for people who were living in these group homes. And the routines were very staff centered and they were inflexible. People had to get up at the same time, they had to have meals together and they had to be out of the house by a certain time and be out all day. They were often treated as a group, so there was still block treatment happening, um, and people were regarded as the guys, as the group, rather than as individuals. And you would see busloads of five or six people in a bus going together on outings, um, and they were outings to look at the community rather than participating in the community as individuals. Um, there was there was less depersonalization. Um, People still had their own clothes um, and, um, and they, had, they were known by their names. So that, that wasn't so bad. But there was still significant social distance between the staff and the people that were supported. So there was a sense, um, even in these new group homes, that people were seen as not like us. There were different utensils, different crockery, different toilets for the staff compared to the people who were living in the group homes. Um, so it was a, a pretty um, poor culture that, that people moved into, and it wasn't that different from what it had been like in the institution. These are just some pictures, uh, which, and you'll see the relevance in a minute, but um, this is what the site looks like now. Um, there's lovely white new houses, and there's lots of lovely grass, and you'll notice there's no people. <laughs> If you go and visit the site now, there is no community there. Um, and in 2021, the last remaining three historic buildings that had been preserved on the site were sold uh, to, to private people. And, and I guess that starts the story of some of the sort of broken promises in that when the site, uh, when the redevelopment happened, there was a promise that there would be a community center on the site, there would be a community CAF, um, there would be a place where there was uh, memories of, of the institution and where people would be able to meet together and help to, in, to be included in this new community. Um, a, a quick look at it from the outside indicates there's almost no community there at all. And that promise was really broken with the sale of these historic buildings. Um, there's been many changes uh, since our original research in terms of the post move. So since 2008, obviously the NDIS has come along and it's more than doubled funding for disability services. And it's introduced new individualized ways of organizing support. And there's much stronger policies now about rights such as choice and control and supported decision-making. But what we found in our research and what continues now is that many people with intellectual disabilities don't have informal support networks that they need to advocate for getting the best type of NDIS plan or to support decision making. People with intellectual disabilities are clearly um, one of the most groups that have benefited least 
from the NDIS. What we've seen is traditional group homes being superseded. Um, perhaps really this was the case even when the queue houses were built. Um, but there's more housing and support options now for people with intellectual disabilities than ever before. It's not just an institution or home or an institution or a group home. There's many more different alternatives and you can get much better support if you want to stay in the family home. But what, what the evidence suggests is that very, very few people with intellectual disabilities have left group homes. They really haven't been supported to exercise choice in this new world of choice and control. And what we've just seen from the research that we've finished over the last year or so is that the quality of support, the quality of the culture, the quality of the individualized support in group homes has dropped quite significantly. Um, so things are getting worse in group homes rather than getting better, even though there's been an increase in funding to disability services as a whole. Um, there's much greater recognition. One of the themes of the book is that the voices of people with intellectual disabilities were rarely heard. And there's much greater recognition now about hearing directly from people with intellectual disabilities, hearing from them about their own lives, but also hearing from them about co-designing policy and services. But I guess the question remains, are the voices of people with intellectual disabilities loud or representative enough? Is the influence that they have as a group commensurate with their size? And they're the largest group of adults in the NDIS, but they're not obviously part of the conversation, um, which is being dominated more and more by people with physical and sensory disabilities without cognitive impairments. We saw the NDIS being really shaped by people without cognitive disabilities, and that's been a continuing issue for people with intellectual disabilities, who, as we know, find it really hard um, to represent their own views. It's obviously some people can do that with the right support, but the question remains, who does represent people with more severe and profound intellectual disabilities, who even with the right support um, will not be able to, to really articulate uh, their views about service systems? Um, there's an increasing dominance of the social model, and there's much less differentiation now of people with intellectual disabilities from all other people with disabilities. There's much less concern now about practice that's specific to people with intellectual disabilities. And that's got something to do with the, with the falling quality of support. So what are though, what are though are the conti what continues to be the same um, as the Q experience? So what continues is the significant disparities in the quality of life uh, for people with intellectual disabilities compared to other people with disabilities and the population in general. They, they continue to do worse in terms of employment, in terms of social inclusion, life expectancy, and health issues. There's continue to be high rates of abuse and neglect by the services that are established either to care or to educate them. And this has become very clear from the testimony and the case studies as part of the Royal Commission, this current Royal Commission's hearings uh, into abuse and neglect for people with intellectual disabilities. There's been many broken promises um, from governments. The broken promises continue. Um, the two clear ones, uh, as I said at the beginning, were about the promise of common facilities on the Q site and the memory of the site. And that was clearly broken with the sale of those historic buildings. But there was also a promised relocation um, of, of the 100 people who were all clustered together in the bottom right-hand corner of the site. The original agreement was they would be scattered, they would be relocated across the site once the site was fully built. So that it was a so it would be a true social inclusion of group homes amongst the commu ordinary community houses. That didn't happen either. It's really not clear why that didn't happen. Um, and that might have made a difference to their community inclusion. But there's also been many ambitious but unfulfilled public policies uh, since the closure of Q, which really just replicates the pattern. There's a continuing failures of the implementation of very ambitious policy. The NDIS has had multiple reviews about problems with the way it operates, and we're in the middle of another one. And it's very evident that the pro promises that were made 
about tier two, about increasing mainstream services and making them more responsive and accessible to people with intellectual disabilities just haven't been followed through. There was a very, very good and very ambitious national disability strategy um, that didn't have any money associated with it. So really that opening up and social inclusion of people and making mainstream services more responsive has just not happened. Um, and I guess to finish, it's worth saying that family members, and they, they figure very much through the history of Q, uh, remain the strongest allies and advocates for people with intellectual disabilities. And it's very clear that services can't replicate the commitment um, that families have to their family members with intellectual disabilities. Um, and and that's, I think that's one of the big questions. How can we replicate for people without strong family members that commitment um, and that way of developing services and support for people? There continue to be many people with intellectual disabilities who don't have family support, who don't have informal networks or other people who can advocate for them. Um, and who aren't getting the help to make decisions um, and to move to more individualized or other options for accommodation. And it seems that the funders in terms of the NDIS and service providers aren't concentrating and helping this group build social connections um, or build high quality services that take account of the unique needs of this group. So I would say that in many ways, the theme of this book continues um, as people with intellectual disabilities continue to be the subjects of the failed um, ambitions uh, of government. Um, so I'm going to stop there. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. There's a couple I can see already, Jacinta. And I might just also try while, we're, while you're answering some questions just to get up one of the very short clips that show uh, somebody who moved out of queue. So over to you, Jacinta. Okay. Thanks, Chris. That would be great to see to see that clip i'm going to you know take the take the advantage of, of being the person talking at the moment chris do you have a perception if you had a magic wand and could do maybe one or two things to create change what do you think it would be <laughs> from my point of view it would be to recognize and this is about Q Cottages was established to provide the best quality support at that time, as, as Leanne says, for people with intellectual disabilities. It was recognised that they were a particular group in the community who were neglected that needed a particular type of support. And, and they were differentiated from other people with disabilities and other groups in the community. And I think they've become invisible. So we talk about people with disabilities now, we talk about NDIS participants as if they're all the same. So I think we need to, we need to recognize the issues that are specific to people with intellectual disabilities, their need for support to make decisions, their need for support to express themselves, their need for support to be engaged just in everyday life. So it's recognizing that, but also recognizing that the social isolation that they have and the lack of community connections, the lack of, for many people, of strong families. And I would, I would develop services that had the intention of supporting people to develop social networks so they could become included. And that's really skilled, long-term, expensive work that we've never done. We don't really know how to do it well. Um, and that's, I think, what we need to focus on. As people who have strong families say, if you have lots of people around you, you're going to be safe. The quality of your services are going to be better because there's people looking out for you. You're going to be more included. And we've got this group of people who are really socially isolated and need an enormous amount of support to build networks and to support decision making. And they're just invisible. So I would make them more visible. <laughs> that's a long answer. Um, can I show this clip? It's about two yes. minutes long. That would be terrific. This, this is one of the clips on the new website, um, which was made by Cameron Rose that he showed last night at the opening. And it's just, it, it will take you back to what it was like at Kew and what it was like when somebody moved out. And here? Yep. yep. 
heaven. Go. There's about there's about six of those films on the on the new, on the website, um, which try to represent people who didn't speak, um, and just gives a snapshot of what life was like for them. Um, thanks to the three of you for actually presenting such such sort of, I uh, you know, uh, so many emotions went through me listening to this, and I think that's the power. Of, of history in many ways and the power of people who are really, really dedicated to hopefully making change. So thank you to the three of you for wonderful presentations. Thanks, Over Jacinta. Here. And the slides will be available and there's links to the to the new website on, on the slides, there's link to the book. If you wanna buy the book, go to Melbourne, Monash University Press. Um, the slides and the recording will be up on our website in the next uh, week. The next seminar is in July, the second Wednesday of July, which I think is about the 14th of July. Um, and it will feature Jacinta Douglas uh, talking about people um, who have moved into independent uh, accommodation who have uh, neurological disabilities. And it will also feature Sharon McDonald, who's from the Summer Foundation, talking about know everything, be everything, skills, attributes, and challenges of effective support coordination in the NDIS, which is a very important topic at this moment in time when I think support coordinators are under enormous the microscope in terms of their skills and, and the roles and their sort of mandate. So please join us in a month's time. Um, we've got two fantastic presentations from the people who are part of our partnership with the Summer Foundation. Thanks very much for coming. Please be in touch with us. You know where to find us if you've got any questions or queries or want anything. Thank you very much.